talk about the identification and characterization of DNA repair, SNP2, switch 2 ATPs in tetrahydrin thermosophy. Okay, I wanted to thank everyone for having me. Uh, my name is Andrew, and the talk I'm going to be giving you is actually the product of most of my undergrad and then my master's degree. Um, so I've been with it a while, and honestly, when it started, it had a different name. Uh, when it started, it was a simple search for RAD16, for a homolog of RAD16 in tetrahymena. But uh, like most scientific projects, it decided to not be so simple, and it expanded out a little bit. So we're going to talk about that. Okay, so just an outline of the presentation real quick. Um, I'm going to go over why we use tetrahymena, but I'll do it briefly because I have a feeling some people in here have seen that before. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the SNF2 switch to ATP ACEs, uh, RAD16 and RAD5 in particular, along with their high eukaryotic homologs. Go over a little bit of background about nucleotide excision repair and translation synthesis, and then we'll get into the data. Uh, so tetrahymena thermophila, it is the binucleated ciliated prost we all know and love. Um, the reason that we use it, uh, at least that it works so well for my project, is because it has two nuclei. Uh, RAD16 is involved in repair of silenced areas of the genome. And tetrahymena has an entire nucleus that's silenced, which would make it a great place to study this. Uh, it's also easy to maintain, quick growth rate. And we have a lot of different techniques that we can use to help us work with it. So the SNF2 switch to ATPases. This is a very large superfamily of proteins. Uh, it's characterized by seven sequence blocks uh, that make up two distinct ATPase domains, an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain. Uh, it was originally discovered and characterized in the Saccharomyces SNF2 protein. And the general function of these domains is to catalyze ATP to ADP to produce energy. And this is done in a DNA-dependent manner. And the resulting energy is actually used to help alter DNA protein dynamics. This large superfamily gets divided into a number of smaller families and subfamilies, which is based on structure and function. Uh, the family we're interested in is the RAD5 and RAD16 subfamily. As the name suggests, it consists of RAD5 and RAD16. And the interesting thing about these two proteins is that their DNA repair involved ATPases, and that they have a number of functions in repair, specifically RAD5. Uh, let's talk about RAD16 since it is the simplest. Uh, it acts in global genome nucleotide excision repair, and that's the only place it's been shown to act. Uh, it makes up one component of nucleotide excision repair factor 4, or NEF4. And the other members of that group are going to be ELC1 and RAD7. Now, structurally, it actually has a zinc finger ring domain, which is an E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, to help transfer ubiquitin to substrate molecules. Uh, it also has, of course, those two ATPase domains, the N-terminal and the A-terminal, and the N-terminal and the C-terminal, apologies. Uh, and the zinc finger ring domain, the E3, is actually situated between those two domains, uh, which is why it's considered embedded in these. It is required for post-damage hyperacetylation of histone H3 because the function of RAD16, as it's been described, is to help modify the local chromatin structure after DNA damage to push the histones away so that you can actually get other repair proteins to the site of damage to help fix that damage. Uh, RAD5 is a little bit more complex and has been implicated in a number of different things as opposed to RAD16, which currently does not have a higher eukaryotic homolog, RAD5 actually has two higher eukaryotic orthologs, SHPRH and HLTF. Uh, it has those same two domains as an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and it has the two ATPase domains. Uh, but it also has a high RAN domain, which is a DNA binding domain. That's a RAD5 characteristic domain. Uh, again, that ring finger is embedded between the two ATPases. And these, these domains in RAD5 have actually been shown to function in distinct manners independent of the other domains. So when you have a mutated ATPase, it can still function in uh, error-free damage bypass signaling. You need certain components to function in certain pathways. However, they're not needed for all of them. For instance, when the ATPase domains are mutated to be non-functional and the E3 domain is non-functional, it can still function as a catalyst for translation synthesis, which is believed to occur largely based on its actual structure. 
without those functional domains. So it's a very complex protein that is involved in more things than RAD16, as far as we know. Let's look at those higher eukaryotic homologs. Uh, we have two that have been well described and well characterized. First is HLTF. It's going to be a helicase-like transcription factor. Uh, one of the big hallmarks of this protein is that it actually interacts with RAD18 uh, during translation synthesis. synthesis. Uh, and it does this to help ubiquitinate the PCNA so that you can actually continue the process of repair for translation synthesis, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Another interesting fact is that HLTF is more UV specific. It's actually preferred after UV damage. As the name would suggest, this is also a transcription factor, and it's been shown to promote basal expression of certain genes, and it does this through a B-box domain, through uh, interacting with a B-box promoter element. Uh, and this is done through the use of its higher end domain, that DNA binding domain. Now, SHPRH is the other ortholog, and it's considered the closest homolog of RAD5 in higher eukaryotes. Uh, it stands for SNF2, histone linker, PhD, and ring finger domain containing helicase. Uh, it's the only time I'm going to say that. Uh, again, RAD18 interaction is a hallmark of this protein uh, for the exact same reasons. It'll ubiquitinate the PCNA in translation synthesis, but this one is MMS specific. So it's preferred after MMS damage, whereas HLTF is preferred after UV. Interestingly enough, SHPRH, even though it is the closest homolog to RAD5, actually lacks that high RAND domain, which is a characteristic component of RAD5. So another interesting thing about HLTF and SHPRH is the way they interact. So these can interact with each other along with PCNA. Again, they act in the same pathway, they act in translation synthesis, uh, and they both interact with RAD18. Now, the choice of HLTF or SHPRH has been shown to be damage type specific, where HLTF is preferred after UV because it recruits a certain polymerase, while SHPRH is preferred after MMS because it recruits a different polymerase. Each polymerase has a better fidelity for the type of damage and has a better chance to faithfully repair that damage. And so the use of one or the other helps to direct that change. Uh, after MMS damage, HLTF actually gets degraded by ubiquitination. Uh, so it gets ubiquitinated and it gets deg degraded at the proteasome. Uh, as of yet, they do not know what the actual E3 is that's responsible for ubiquitinating HLTF. Uh, after, after UV damage, HLTF will actually bind to SHPRH. And that binding is going to prevent SHPRH from interacting with RAD18, leaving the only interaction partner as HLTF, which is how it's going to determine which polymerase it's actually going to use in those pathways. So some background on those types of repair, which is going to be a little bit short. Uh, nucleotide excision repair. Uh, it's a stepwise pathway of DNA damage repair, and specifically it's going to repair UV-induced damage. Uh, cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers, 6,4 photo products, any damage that occurs between bases as opposed to on a single base. So as long as those two bases are linked, nucleotide excision repair is what you're going to use. And this process is highly conserved. And the reason for that is that DNA is the same, the type of damage is the same, and so the same process can be used to repair it. Now it actually functions in two distinct ways. The first is transcription coupled repair. And in transcription coupled repair, the actual signal for finding damage is when your polymerase stalls. And so that's going to be the initiating step of that type of repair. As opposed to global genome repair, which is going to occur in areas of the genome that aren't being transcribed. Now this requires an actual surveillance for damage, which is where RAD4 and RAD23 are going to come in. They're going to have a general affinity for damaged DNA, and they're going to find that. Now, RAD16 only functions in global genome repair, and that's for a reason. In transcription-coupled repair, your histone structure has already been moved to allow for transcription. You have other factors in the area that are actually moving them for you, or they've already been moved. In global genome repair, these areas aren't being transcribed, and because they're not being transcribed, the histones are still in the way, and you need a factor which is going to help move those histones and allow access to the proteins, and that's the function of RAD16. So that's where we're going to see the activity of RAD16. Uh, translation synthesis is going to be where we're going to see RAD5. Uh, 
Now, it's DNA repair, and that's in quotes for a reason. Uh, and I will get to that in just a moment. So this is going to occur during replication. And when you're replicating the DNA, your polymerase is chugging along. It's making copies. And it stalls with the PCNA. And it can stall because of a bulky adduct, because of a break. But when it stalls, that's the actual signal for tra translation synthesis to occur. And that process is stepwise. You modify the clamp so that you can release the polymerase. You're going to load on your repair polymerase. And then you're going to reform that replication complex. Now, the reason that this is DNA repair in quotes is because at no point in this process does that initial damage get repaired. This is a stopgap, so you can get over that piece of damage and continue replication, because the consequences of one strand lagging very far behind the other is going to cause much larger breaks in the DNA as compared to a small cyclobutane pyrimidine dimer or another effect. Uh, additionally, while this will not repair the damage that was initially there. There's also the chance that it introduces a mutation when it tries to replicate that new strand across the damage. Uh, again, those two polymerases, polymerase eta and polymerase kappa, actually help because they have a better chance of repairing the type of damage specifically. They recognize the damaged nucleotides, and so they have a better chance of putting in the proper nucleotides. And so HLTF and SHPRH are actually going to play selective roles in this process to determine how that's going to occur. So we got the background done. Let's talk about where the work started. Uh, what we actually did was we started with the yeast genomic sequence for RAD16, and we used BLAST to try and identify homologs of that in tetrahymena. And we actually found four potential homologs, uh, RAD16.1, 16NH, 5.1, and 5.2. From there, we wanted to look at the domain structure of the proteins. We wanted to look at their relationships and get a broader sense of how they were oriented, because bioinformatics can be a very powerful tool in determining homology. And again, 5 and 16 are extremely similar. They have very similar domains, and they're hard to tell apart. So when we're actually looking at these domains, we see that in yeast rad 5, it has this gray higher end domain. It has the two ATPase domains, the green and the yellow, and it has the E3 ubiquitin ligase domain in blue. RAD16 has both the ATPases and the E3 ubiquitin ligase. Now, of the four homologs in tetrahymena, only one has a higher end domain that was recognized by bioinformatic analysis, and that would be RAD5.2. Uh, all of them contain what are bioinformatically functional versions of the two ATPases and the E3 ubiquitin ligase. What's more, these domains are actually very well conserved. And so bioinformatically, they're all very, very close. And so we wanted to look at their actual relationships. So phylogenetically, uh, you get a little bit of info here. The two RAD5s and tetrahymen are closely related, while 16NH seems to be closer to the yeast versions, and 16.1 is very far off. Uh, but you actually get more out of this data when you include homologs from higher eukaryotes. So SM3L1, 2, and 3 are all HLTF versions in Arabidopsis. Uh, and when we look at the HLTF, what we actually see is that RAD5.2 seems to be much more closely related to HLTF, uh, while 5.1 tends to be closer to yeast, and 16NH tends to be a little bit more distant. But again, 16.1 is much further from all of them, although none of them look quite like SHPRH. Uh, and so these data. Again, not particularly helpful in determining what's a homolog of 16 and what's a homolog of 5, because it tends to vary with what other organisms you look at. So uh, the next thing we did is we wanted to try and 3D model these to get a sense of what their actual structures were, to try and get an idea of how they're related. Uh, Eastrad 5 actually has a helical structure. It's predicted to have a helical structure. Uh, the only other version that actually has what we would consider a helical structure as 16 and H, which again lacks that higher end domain. Uh, East RAD 16 is more circular, which is more consistent with RAD 5.1 in tetrahymena, uh, while 5.2 looks like it's sort of a halfway measure between the two. So we wanted to look at actually these sequences in a little bit more detail. 
we know about HLTF is that it has that high RAND domain. But that a specific portion of that higher-end domain is the DNA binding domain. And that DNA binding domain is actually going to be what functionally binds to the B-box domain and allows for activity as a transcription factor. What we see is that when we're comparing the human HLTF to tetrahymena rad 5.2, it's actually extremely well conserved in this area, um, which contains a few of the critical residues for the actual DNA binding. When we then look at 5.1, what we see is that, again, this domain is fairly well conserved. Even though this wasn't shown to have a higher end domain, it does have a fair number of the functional residues that would allow it to act as a DNA binding domain. Uh, for 16NH, again, most of these residues that, are, that need to be conserved are conserved. And so despite the fact that they lack this higher end domain, they seem to have the functional components to still act as transcription factors. Uh, so we actually wanted to look at the promoter regions. Uh, and what we saw is that these promoter regions have sequences that are extremely similar or direct matches to B-box domains in all three of these cases. Now, we know that the high RAND domain, the DNA binding domain, will actually interact with these B-box domains, and that's going to allow it to influence basal level transcription. And so it looks like these homologs have the ability to both act on this site and have this site acted on for them. Uh, so the bioinformatics tend to be helpful, but you can't stop there, and certainly not here when things are so similar. And so we actually wanted to look at how we could functionally distinguish these. And the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to understand their expression along with the phenotypic consequences of loss. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to look at expression profiles. So we damage them with three different damaging agents, UV, which should induce NER and thus RAD16 should be upregulated, MMS, which will induce double strand break repair, which will upregulate RAD5, and hydrogen peroxide, which will induce base excision repair and could also upregulate RAD5. Uh, we took samples at zero to four hours for both control and damaged cells, and then we set the threshold to the control levels. So a value of two is going to be a two-fold increase, three is going to be a three-fold increase in the expression of those genes at time points. We're actually going to use qPCR to do this. So let's look at the data. Uh, we'll start with 16.1 because it's going to be the easiest. 16.1 uh, does not have any significant increases after damage. As a matter of fact, it has significant decreases. And what this tells us is that this is not a DNA repair gene. If it were, after some type of damage, it would actually be upregulated. But in all instances, it's downregulated. And it's downregulated significantly and consistently. Uh, and so this is the last time we'll discuss 16.1. It's nice to get one of these off of the plate. Uh, next, we're going to look at RAD 5.1. In the hydrogen peroxide, which is white, we're going to see a common pattern across all of the homologs. And that pattern is that expression starts very high initially, but tapers closer to wild type levels as we get towards the end of our time course. And um, we're going to see this in 5.1, we're going to see this in 16NH, and we're going to see this in 5.2. Uh, we actually believe that this is a more general stress response because hydrogen peroxide can cause a much wider range of oxidative stress to cells, including on the organelle level. And so this is a general stress response as opposed to something specific since it gets upregulated in multiple instances. When we get to looking at the MMS, what we actually see is that 5.1 is upregulated very high and very quickly, and that's going to be our stripe bars. Uh, while 5.2 is also upregulated very quickly and at very high levels. Uh, 16NH is not going to have the same reaction. It won't actually get upregulated, and only then at twofold until four hours after damage. And again, we expect RAD5 or something that's RAD5-like to be upregulated after MMS, but RAD16 shouldn't be. It's only implicated in UV damage. Uh, after UV damage, we see that 5.1 gets upregulated uh, a little bit later. 5.2 begins early, and it continues up through the cycle, while 16NH is specifically upregulated after UV at two hours 
and it tapers closer to wild type levels as we go on. So at this point, we're hoping, thinking, that 16NH is probably 16. It seems to be UV specific, whereas 5.1 and 5.2 are more general. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to create shRNA knockdowns of each of these three genes to try and determine what actually happens to tetrahymena, how sensitive they become to damaging agents if we knock down the expression. And so for each one, we have, an, we have a construct that's constitutively expressed under the beta tubulin promoter. And these are going to be making an RNA that's going to help knock down the expression of that gene. Once we have these, what we're actually going to do is we're going to test their survival to two damaging agents, the two more specific ones, MMS and UV. Here's what we saw. So when we treat with UV, uh, in, the, in this instance, 100 joules per meter squared of UV, uh, C522, our wild type strain, has about a 55 to 60 percent survival rate. Uh, the RAD 5.2 knockdown is not altered from that, but 5.1 and 16NH are both extremely sensitive to UV, uh, about 5 to 10 percent survival rates after this. Uh, when we look at MMS, we see something that's a little bit more interesting. Again, 5.2 has no change after MMS. It's surviving just as well as wild type. But 5.1 and 16NH are both surviving more poorly. Now, we know that 16NH is only upregulated after UV uh, significantly, and that 5.1 and 5.2 were both heavily upregulated after both MMS and UV, and yet 5.2 is not surviving any more poorly uh, in the knockdown strain. And 5.1 is surviving poorly in both. Uh, so we wanted to figure out why this was. Uh, so what we actually did was we wanted to take those knockdown strains, damage them again, and actually look at the expression of the RNAs for each gene in each knockdown strain. So in this first one, we're looking in the RAD16 knockdown strain. So the only thing that should be down is RAD16, RAD16NH. We actually find is that basally it's down, but we also see significant decreases in RAD5.2 basal levels and 5.1 basal levels, which is not what we expect. Uh, 16 isn't a transcription factor. RAD5 isn't a transcription factor. HLTF is, but not RAD5. Uh, we also notice is that after MMS damage, these are also significantly decreased. RAD16 and H levels are down, 5.2 levels are down, 5.1 levels are down. And the 16 knockdown, the actual shRNA used, has no potential to hit the others. That sequence doesn't blast to anything else in tetrahymena. It was actually the most specific one we could find. But there's an effect on the other homologs. Interestingly enough, after UV, we don't see this decrease in expression carry over. They were down basally, but they're either upregulated or not changed after damage, which I'll talk about in a minute as we get through these. Uh, 5.1. Uh, again, we're seeing that basal levels of 5.1 are actually down in the knockdown, but so are basal levels of 5.2 and 16 NH. And after MMS, those 16 NH levels stay down, while in the 5.1 and 5.2, they continue to increase. Now, after UV, Basal levels are again down, but there's no decrease in the post-damage levels. And this is actually going to carry over to 5.2, which, interestingly enough, no basal level decreases, no significant basal level decreases. But what we do see is a decrease in the post-damage levels of RAD16 in both cases. And in one of these cases, what we actually have is uh, 5.2 being significantly upregulated. Uh, so what we actually know about these uh, is that the promoter we use, the beta tubulin one promoter, when we actually looked at it and we analyzed it, the beta tubulin one promoter is actually downregulated pretty heavily after UV and after MMS. Uh, it's constitutively expressed, but the amount of RNA being made is still much smaller than it was initially. What this is going to do is it's actually going to allow you to recover from having basal level decreases because you're going to decrease the amount of the hairpin that you make, decrease the amount of knocking down you're actually doing, uh, 
and it's going to allow you to recover your post-damage phenotype. The reason that we actually see this occurring everywhere except here is actually, actually makes a lot of sense. And we'll go on, just remember this portion of the figure. So a summary of the data. Uh, we know that 16NH actually is specifically upregulated after UV and that it doesn't change after MMS. We know that the knockdown has decreased survival after UV and MMS, and then it actually decreases the basal levels of all three homologs, 16NH, 5.1, and 5.2. Interestingly enough, it actually increases the post-UV levels of RAD 16NH. 5.1, again, specifically upregulated after UV and MMS. The knockdown decreases survival under both conditions, and it decreases the basal levels of all three homologs. Again, it also decreases the post-MMS levels of RAD 16NH. 5.2, much like 5.1, is upregulated after UV and MMS, but it doesn't have an effect on basal levels, and it has wild-type survival. Interestingly enough, the knockdown actually decreases RAD 16NH levels after damage, and we see this when 5.2 levels seem to increase. That's what that means. Uh, we know that the 16NH knockdown is effective. Uh, we also know that it leads to a change in the basal expression of the others. Uh, the reason that this doesn't hold after MMS, the reason that when we see that decrease carry, it's an MMS, is most likely due to the fact that 16NH isn't upregulated after MMS. So if we start with a basal decrease in 16NH and that has an effect on the levels of 5.1 and 5.2, then if we don't turn 16NH up after MMS, those basal level changes are going to carry over to post-damage. If we upregulate 16NH again, then it's actually going to be able to recover from that. Uh, we also believe is that it's actually the decreased expression of all three homologs that may lead to that survivability deficiency, as opposed to one or the other. Uh, 5.1, again, we know the knockdown is effective and it alters the basal levels of all three. Uh, expression doesn't alter post-damage levels except for 16NH. And again, this is after MMS, because even if you remove the initial block of the SHRNA, 16NH isn't supposed to be upregulated after MMS, and so it can't recover that phenotype. It can't recover its expression levels. Uh, 5.2, knockdown is mostly ineffective, although we know it's doing something because it seems to affect the levels of 16NH. We don't know whether this is indirect or direct, whether having too much 5.2 leads to having less 16NH or if having more 5.2 actually directly causes that, if there's some sort of feedback. Uh, so just some conclusions. We have three damage-specific expression homologs, 5.1, 5.2, and 16NH. Only two of them have survival deficiencies, 5.1 and 16NH, and they're present after both types of damage, which is not characteristic of RAD16. Interestingly enough, it looks like these might actually be much closer to HLTF than they are to any lower eukaryotic version of RAD5 or 16, simply because these act as what would appear transcription factors, where a decrease in one leads directly to a decrease in the other two. Um, and so we believe they might actually be more closely related. Again, we don't know that HLTF has been shown to act to alter expression of repair genes. Uh, but that has, hasn't actually been studied, so we don't know. Uh, future directions, I'm going to skip over this because I am short for time, but feel free to talk to me about it in the hall. Uh, acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Dr. Smith for putting up with me for, oh, about seven years now. Um, must not have been easy. Uh, Smith Lab, two people in particular, Rachel Molnar and Emily Nischwitz, for their help on an RNA extraction. Uh, for our time course with four separate strains tends to get a little bit intensive. Uh, Missouri State University, both our department and the Graduate College for funding to get me here. There are my references, and I will take any questions. I'm just curious about your interpretation that this uh, Huron domain is actually acting as a, um, in a transcriptional regulatory capacity because I think in HTLF it's been recently shown that the herin domain is actually important to recruit the protein to uh, replication forks. It specifically recognizes the three prime end to single strand DNA. So I'm wondering 
Could the same be true here, that that urine domain is actually important to localize these proteins to damage and they're not transcription factors? So that could be the case, although there was a paper where they actually found that HLTF and specifically a segment that lies within the HIRAN domain. So not necessarily the HIRAN domain itself, but a specific sequence, the DNA binding sequence in there, actually did function. And when it was mutated or when the B-box was mutated on the promoter, that it wouldn't actually, that it could act as a transcription factor. So there's data that it does that. The high, that domain will actually act to bind DNA, but it's also been shown to act as a transcription factor in at least one instance with a plasminogen activating factor. Humans, um, 